Okay, I think we're going to start. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hillary, and I'm a member of the steering committee for Librarians and Archivists of Palestine. And we're very excited today to be joined by Mosab Abu Toha, who is the author of our One Book Many Communities title for 2024. Uh, librarians and Archivists with Palestine is a network of self-defined librarians, archivists, and information workers in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. Uh, we are currently uh, hosting a fundraiser for two uh, cultural centers in the West Bank. Uh, they are the Yaffa Cultural Center in Balata Refugee Camp in Nablus and the Laji Center and Ida Refugee Camp in Bethlehem. Um, they both addition to being cultural centers, they contain uh, libraries, uh, specifically children's libraries that really serve their local communities. So we'd appreciate uh, any contributions to that campaign. We've currently raised uh, 5,000 US dollars so far and we'd love to, to double that. And I also wanna let you know uh, that there are, will be more uh, One Book Many Communities campaigns uh, events in April and May. Besides this, um, some of them are online, like this one, and can be joined by anyone from anywhere, and some are in person, some might be in your community, and you can even uh, have your own, and so um, I thank you, Maggie. Maggie shared, uh, is going to share a link in the chat for more One Book events, um, so please consider joining us again uh, for that, and um, oh my goodness. Oh, and I lost, oh, I, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, when I thought I had copied some very, some bio text for our guest, but we're uh, flying by the seat of our pants a little bit today. So our guest, of course, is Masab Abu Toha, who is a poet, writer, and librarian uh, from Gaza. He is the author of um, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear, Poems from Gaza, which is the 2024 title for our One Book Many Communities campaign, which is a multi-award winner. And uh, we're just very thankful to have him joining us today. Uh, Masab, you told us you wanted to start uh, by reading some poems. Uh, so please, uh, when you're ready. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Hilary, for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, event. And thanks. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm really greatly honored to be chosen by librarians and archivists for Palestine uh, for this year to be named one book, uh, one community. Um, and it it means a lot to me on a personal level and also uh, to my fellow poets and writers in Gaza, many of whom were killed, many of whom have been uh, injured, many of whom lost their uh, houses, their libraries. Um, their, their loved ones, uh, many of whom are living in tents right now. And uh, I'm sure if they had the internet connection or if they had the luxury of uh, following the news of what's happening outside of Gaza, they would appreciate this uh, so much. Um, I'm going to start off by reading uh, some poems from my book, Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear. And I have, I still have this copy um, which was the only copy, or may, it's it's the only book from my home that survived the bombing of my house in in October twenty seventh, and it was the only book that I took with me outside of Gaza. Uh, but luckily, as you see behind me, uh, many of my uh, kind friends uh, sent me books to where I am right now in Cairo. But I told them not to send uh, any any more books because I can't carry these books with me. Uh, to my next destination. <clears throat> so I'm going to read some poems uh, from my book, and then I will follow with by reading uh, a few new poems that were published, especially during the ongoing genocide. I'm going to read uh, some parts of my first poem, which is one of my uh, favorite poems in the book, Palestine, AZ. A. An apple that fell from the table on a dark evening when man-made lightning flashed through the kitchen, the streets, 
and the sky, rattling the cupboards and breaking the dishes. Am is the linking verb that follows I in the present tense, when I'm no longer present, when I'm shattered. B, a book that doesn't mention my language or my country and has maps of every place except for my birthplace as if I were an illegitimate child on Mother Earth. Borders are those invented lines drawn with ash on maps and soon into the ground by bullets. C. Gaza is a city where tourists gather to take photos next to destroyed buildings or graveyards. A country that exists only in my mind. Its flag has no room to fly freely. But there is a space on the coffins of my countrymen. I'm going to skip some letters. G. How are you, Musab? I'm good. I hate this word. It has no meaning to me. Your English is good, Musab. Thanks. When I was asked to fill in a form of, for my US J-1 visa application, my country, Palestine, was not on the list. Okay for me, my gender was. I, images on the walls of buildings, a child who was shot by an Israeli sniper or killed during an Israeli raid en route to school. Her picture was placed on her desk at school. Her picture stares at the blackboard while the air sits in her chair. I wake up ill when gloomy ideas about what might have, ha what might have, ha have happened to me come into my dream. What if I had stopped for a few seconds at the window when a bullet from nowhere ripped through the glass? K. Okay. My grandfather kept to his house, sorry, my grandfather kept the key to his house in Yaffa in 1948. He thought they would return in a few days. His name was Hassan. The house was destroyed. Others built a new one in its place. Hassan died in Gaza in 1986. The key has rusted, but it still exists somewhere, longing for the old wooden door. In Gaza, you don't know what you are guilty of. It feels like living in a Kafka novel. M. Marhaba means hi or welcome. We say marhaba to everyone we see. It's like a warm hug. We don't use it, however, when soldiers or their bullets or bombs visit us. Such guests not only leave their ship, but also take everything we love. My dad used to prepare milk for us with some khirshalla before school. I was in third grade and my mother was at hospital taking care of my brother. My brother died in 2016. R. I was born in November. My mother told me she was walking on the beach with my, my father. It turned stormy and began to rain. My mother felt pain, and an hour later, she gave birth to me. I love the rain and the sea. The last two things I heard before I came into this horrible world. Tea. In summer, I drink tea with mint. In winter, I, I, I add dried sage. Anyone who visits, even if it's a neighbor knocking at the door to ask what about what day or date it is, I offer them tea. Offering tea is like saying marhaba. They once said Palestine will be free tomorrow. What is freedom? What is tomorrow? How long does it last? Why? Yafa is my daughter's name. I put my ears near her mouth when she speaks and I hear Yafa's sea, waves lapping against the shore. I look in her eyes and I see my grandparents' footsteps still imprinted on the sand. How did you leave Gaza? Do you plan to return? You should stay in the US. You mustn't think of going back to Gaza. Things paid people say to me. Next one, what is home? What is home? It is the shade of trees on my way to school before they were uprooted. It is my grandparents' black and white wedding photo before the walls crumbled. It is my uncle's prayer rug 
where dozens of ants slept on wintry nights before it was looted and put in a museum. It is the oven my mother used to bake bread and roast chicken before a bomb reduced our house to ashes. It is the cafe, sorry. It is the cafe where I watched football matches and played. My child stops me. Can a four letter world hold all of these? On a starless night, on a starless night, I toss and turn, the air shakes and I fall out of bed. I look out my window, the house next door no longer stands. It's lying like an old carpet on the floor of the air, trampled by missiles, fat slippers flying off legless feet. I never knew my neighbors still had that small TV, that the old painting still hung on their walls, that their cat had kittens. Palestinian streets. My city's streets are nameless. If a Palestinian gets killed by a sniper or a drone, we name the street after them. Chil children learn their numbers best when they can count how many homes or schools were destroyed, how many mothers and fathers were wounded or thrown into jail. Grown-ups in Palestine only use their IDs so as not to forget who they are. Next poem. We love what we have. We love what we have, no matter how little. Because if we don't, everything will be gone. If we don't, we will no longer exist since there is nothing here for us to stay for. What's here is something we are still building. It's something we cannot yet see because we are part of it. Someday soon, this building will stand on its own while we we will be the trees that protect it from the fierce wind, the trees that will give shade to children playing, sleeping inside or, or playing on swings. A litany for one land after Audrey Lord. For those living on the other side, we can see you. We can see the rain when it pours on your, our fields, on your, our valleys. And when it slides down the roofs of your modern houses, built atop our homes. Can you take off your sunglasses and look at us here? See how the rain has flooded our streets, how the children's umbrellas have been pierced by a prickly downpour on their way to school. The trees you see have been watered with our tears. They bear no fruit. The red roses take their color from our blood. They smell of death. The river that separates us from you is just a mirage you created when you expelled us. It is one land. For those who are standing on the other side, shooting at us, spitting on us, how long can you stand there fenced by hate? Are you going to take to keep your black glasses on until you are unable to put them down? Soon, we won't be here for you to watch. It won't matter if you can blink or, or your eyes or not, if you can stand or not. You won't cross that river to take more land because you will vanish into your mirage. You can't build a, col a new colony on our graves. And when we die, our bones will continue to grow, to reach and intertwine with the roots of the olive and orange trees, to bathe in the sweet Yaffa Sea. One day, we will be born again when you are not there because this land knows us. She is our mother. We, when we die, we are just resting in her womb until the darkness is cleared. For those who are not here anymore, we have been here forever. We have been speaking, but you never cared to listen. Silence of water. Father typing on a keyboard. Mother Mother reading the morning paper aloud to cover the sound of a neighbor's radio. Hanging lamp swinging in the breeze from a cracked window. Flies lose balance sometimes. Black and white pictures on the wall search for colors. 
kettle and stove. One big drop hammers the roof. One big drop hammers the roof. No lightning, thunder, or clouds. It rains only on this house. Dust and concrete stuff the nostrils of the other houses. Water on the stove no longer boils. Shrapnel has cut its throat. Shrapnel looking for laughter. The house has been bombed. Everyone dead. The kids, the parents, the toys, the actors on TV, characters in novels, personas in poetry collections, the I, the he, and the she. No pronouns left, not even for kids when they learn parts of speech next year. Shrapnel flies in the dark, looks for the family's peals of laughter, hiding behind piles of disfigured walls and bleeding picture frames. The radio no longer speaks. Its batteries have burned. The antenna is broken. Even the broadcaster felt the pain when the radio was hit. Even we, hearing the bomb as it fell, threw ourselves to the ground, each of us counting the others around them. We were safe, but our hearts still ache. Okay, next one is Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear. And this is the title of my poetry book. And it's written to my doctor who uh, did a surgery on my right ear when I was in the US. Things You May Find Hidden in My Ear for Alicia M. Kusnell, MD. One, when you open my ear, touch it gently. My mother's voice lingers somewhere inside. Her voice is the echo that helps recover my equilibrium when I feel dizzy during my attentiveness. You may encounter songs in Arabic, poems in English I recite to myself, or a song I chant to the chirping birds in our backyard. When you sit to the cut, don't forget to put all these back in my ear. Put them back in order, as you would do with the books on your shelf. Two, the drone's buzzing sound, the roar of an F-16, the screams of bombs falling on houses, on fields, and on bodies, of rockets flying away. Rid my tiny ear canal of them all. Spray the perfume of your smiles on the incision. Inject the song of life into my veins to wake me up. Gently beat the drum, so my mind may dance with yours, my doctor, day and night. I'm going to read one more poem from the book. Forever Homeless. Before my long travel, I pack my suitcases, stuff them with some sand from our land, some scent from my mother's kitchen, and the sounds of birds in the morning. And in my pockets, I put the four direction. My hands are the compass. At the airport, I beg the officers not to open the suitcases and if needed, to touch my clothes gently. Otherwise, I would be standing on nothing, surrounded by nothing, see nothing. I would be weightless and forever homeless. I'm going to read three new poems, which will be part of my uh, a new poetry book, which I'm going to announce uh, maybe in a few days, hopefully. The first one is called Obit. To the shadow I had left alone before I crossed the border, my shadow that stayed lonely and hid in the dark of the night, freezing where it was, never needing a visa. To my shadow that's been waiting for my return, homeless, except when I was walking by its side in the summer light. To my shadow that, wish, that wishes to go to school with the children of morning, but couldn't fit through the classroom doors. To my shadow that has caught cold now, that's been sneezing and coughing, no one there saying to it, God bless. To my shadow that's been crushed by cars and vans, it's a chest pierced by shrapnel and bullets flying with no wings. My shadow 
that no one's attending to, bleeding black blood through its memory, now and forever. There's something wrong with the... Okay, then the, the other poem uh, is called uh, Gaza Notebooks, 2022-2023. These were some small poems that I wrote before uh, the genocide. So I'm going to read some of them because it's a long one. In fifth grade, I visit the school library. On one wall next to the door, a poster claims, if you read books, you live more than one life. Now I'm 30. No, I'm 31. Now I'm 30. And whenever I look at faces around me, old or young, in Gaza, on the foreheads I read, if you live in Gaza, you die several times. She asked her teacher if there are four directions, then why do we have only two feet? Nineteen forty-eight. No one at home. The doorknob only dust touches it now. The pots grow thirsty. The frying pans miss the smell of of olive oil. The clothes lines pine for soap scent. The flower pot, the window, the key, the language. Stones of house after the explosion get Alzheimer's. Some stones forget they were in a wall, in a bedroom or a kitchen or a bathroom, some in a ceiling. Some forget they sat behind photo frames for years. A few stones forget they were stones, those hit by the bomb. <clears throat> okay, uh, the last poem uh, was published just early, I mean, last month, uh, March 21st. And it's about uh, two things uh, that I watched and saw uh, while I was in Gaza and while I'm here in Cairo following the news. Uh, one is uh, the scene of a father and his daughter who were trying to escape uh, their house. The father and the daughter were carrying uh, backpacks, uh, but they were shot dead by an Israeli uh, sniper or were killed by an airstrike. And the other uh, story is the story of some cats and dogs eating the flesh of dead people who were left in the streets for days and weeks. The moon, she is lying on the asphalt, her small belly, her chest, her forehead, her hands, her cold feet bare in the night. A hungry cat paces, shrapnel rings as it hits neighboring houses already bombed. The cat grows hungrier. The cat sees the girl, her wounds still warm, hungrier. The girl's father lies next to her on his back. The backpack he wears still has the girl's favorite candy and a small toy. The girl was waiting till they arrived to eat her, her, her lollipop. The cat gets close to try the flesh. A bomb pounds the street. No flesh, no girl, no father, no cat. Nobody is hungry. The moon overhead is not the moon. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that reading, Masab, and um, for but telling us about your upcoming book as well. Um, so we got it's a exclusive. Of, yeah, I mean, here, there you go. Um, Librarians, archivist, Palestine exclusive. Um, so we got uh, questions about your process as a writer. We got questions about uh, arts and culture. And um, so I'm gonna ask, um, as a librarian yourself, what would you like to see from librarians and other cultural heritage workers around the world right now with what is happening in Gaza? So you're asking about Gaza or what the librarians are doing outside, sorry? Yeah, like um, what what would how would how what is a way they could help as librarians and cultural workers? Okay. 
But I think I think the work that you are doing is very essential by highlighting the destruction that's been, uh, you know, visited upon the culture in Gaza, um, supporting libraries. But I, I think, I mean, now, now you are supporting and funding uh, generously uh, two cultural centers in the West Bank. Um, and I think uh, next time, I hope that we are going to do something similar to Gaza. Uh, to to Gazan libraries and cultural centers, but unfortunately, I mean the, the the West Bank is occupied by the Israeli army and the Israeli state, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that what is happening in the West Bank is similar to what's happening in Gaza. What's happening in Gaza right now is a complete destruction of life, uh, including the destruction of hospitals, of uh, clinics, of pharmacies, of schools, of universities. Of libraries and cultural centers and and theaters. Um, so I hope I, I hope that uh, when this ends, uh, that we will have some fundraisers and also big organizations supporting the reconstruction. I mean, I'm I'm not sure if this will be happening because what's been uh, dis destroyed in Gaza is not only libraries or cultural center, but houses. People have no place to return to. If they were able to return to the to the to the places where their houses used to be, uh, unfortunately, uh, so Israel is not only destroying uh, what makes what makes what make people uh, live, like pharmacies and hospitals and you know uh, everything necessary in, in people's life. So Israel is trying to wipe out everything that that indicates that there is you know a community here, you know doctors and journalists and writers and you know, teachers. So they are wiping out everything. Um, so I, I hope that in the next stages after this ends, that uh, the that cultural workers and librarians and activists and outside world will support by rebuilding what has been destroyed and by uh, by providing more education opportunities to people in Gaza to learn how to serve their community after this huge destruction to everything. Absolutely. Um, you touched on a related question I want to want to ask. Um, sometimes people talk about the the killing of journalists as a way to silence the flow of information. Um, could you also say, by extension, that the murder of information and cultural heritage workers, artists, is the silencing mm. of of culture <clears throat> and history as well? I think the, the kind of people they are uh, targeting and killing or kidnapping from their workplace. For example, many journalists were working uh, from hospitals because it would be a safer place for them uh, to to report uh, from. Um, so they killed many journalists. They tried to kill uh, Al Jazeera's uh, chief correspondent, Walid Dahdou. He lost his family. Uh, I mean, many members of his family, the last of whom were, was his son, Hamza. Uh, they killed. They killed his cameraman. They killed universe, many university professors in Gaza. Uh, one one big example is Rifat Al Arair, who is a, a distinguished uh, educator and translator and and a writing uh, mentor. Um, so they want to to kill. They want to kill people. I mean, babies and their parents, and you know, to destroy everything that that supports them to continue their lives. But at the same time, they kill people who might report on what's happening. So they want to kill to kill the people and they want to prevent anyone who is able to uh, report on what's happening from reporting. So they want to kill you and bury you and no one should know about you. And that's that's been happening not only to journalists and uh, to families, but also to to the houses. I mean, they, they, Israel is not only getting rid of people, but they are getting rid of uh, Gaza as as a city. So, so when I, if if I were able to return to my neighborhood, I wouldn't recognize it. I want, for example, maybe ten years later, tell my son, "You see this house? I used to play there with my friend. I used to walk this street. Uh, there was there used to be a tree here under which I was writing my poems." Or you know, I was watching the sunset. I wouldn't be able to do that because they are just destroying the city itself. They destroy its people and they destroy the people who 
would explain and show to the whole world what it means to be from Gaza. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. Um, I had someone, uh, when we asked people to ask questions, we had, had someone who um, wanted to learn more about how um, there's a restriction, uh, the state of Israel creates restrictions uh, on what can come into Gaza. And one of those uh, makes it uh, difficult to import books, which can impact uh, bookstores, libraries, uh, education centers, and, and culture. Can you tell us a little bit about about living under that and how that's affected you and people you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there is there is one fact that maybe ninety percent of the people in the world don't know, which is uh, one facet of Gaza being under siege that any any package of books or clothes or gifts that is coming towards Gaza should come through Israel. So Israel controls what comes in and when this thing comes to Gaza. So I, I usually had many books sent to me, uh, whether as as an individual or as a founder of the library, the Edward Said Public Library. I I would keep track of uh, this box of books, and it would say that it uh, it would take about ten business days, just like you would you know order something or someone ships something to you uh, via US, USPS or UPS or FedEx. So I keep track. I have the tracking number and I follow the the package where it's going. It arrives in Israel, in Tel Aviv, uh, after 10 days uh, of being shipped. And then it remains there for about a month or, or, or two. And Israel can, can, can freeze this uh, postal service uh, and many books. Uh, one time I, I didn't receive books for about three months. I was trying to, you know, I was still starting to, uh, to, found, to, to establish the Edward Said Library and the, the mail service stopped for three months because Israel decided to punish Gaza uh, for three months. This is one thing. And the other thing is that we are unable even to get mail from our fellow writers uh, from the West Bank, not only to get books from America or Europe, but even to get books from some friends in the West Bank uh, is, is, is not possible for us, uh, except, you know, how, how people go about this, they would, you know, send a copy or two copies of a friend's book with someone who is a patient or who is a worker who is coming back to Gaza from the West Bank. So someone would pick it for you. Um, I get I got a lot of calls in the past from uh, uh, mail companies in the West Bank uh, telling me to to go to the West Bank and pick uh, a box of books that uh, the, the, that was shipped to me from uh, the US or from Europe because these companies only deliver to the West Bank. Gaza is not on the list. Even though on the box itself, there was the, destin the final destination was Gaza under my name. So I, I would get a call from this uh, mail company in the West Bank who is, I mean, they are, I mean, uh, they collaborate with that big company. So they would give me a call. They say, we have your books in Ramallah in the West Bank. Uh, can you come and pick, pick your books from there? We, we don't deliver to, deliver to Gaza. I tell them, come on, I mean, I'm, I'm in Gaza. I can't even go to go, go to Jerusalem or to the West Bank to attend the visa interview. Israel haven't allowed me several times to go to Jerusalem just to attend my visa interview and return to Gaza the same day. And these people are asking me to just go to the West Bank and pick these books, uh, you know, and, and go back to Gaza, which, which was not possible at all. I visited many stores in Gaza uh, who sold books. Uh, which sold books and uh, I, I I mean I, I all the time I saw the same books on the shelves I told the person uh, who is managing this bookstore I mean why do you do, why don't you have uh, new books you know people from 2016 or 17 I mean why do you still have the, don't you have books from 2022 or 2021 2023 and he said first of all it's not easy to get books into Gaza we have to wait for months or and we have to pay a lot of taxes and the other thing is that people in Gaza do not have the luxury of buying books of paying money to buy books because the economic is devastated okay uh, people people can barely you know uh, buy necessary food for their children or to pay 
uh, tuition for their universities and colleges. Uh, but I just explained to you what it means to be a librarian or a book lover from Gaza. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's um, infuriating. Um, so lot, like I said, a lot of folks want to know about your writing process. So one um, question we got was, what inspired you to start writing poetry and how has your journey as a poet evolved over time? Okay. I think maybe people can tell uh, more about me rather than I tell about me, how, how I emerged or how, how I am, you know, developed as a poet. I remember myself writing, uh, you know, a couple, sorry, a line of poetry here and a couple of lines there uh, in 2014, when Gaza was uh, under the Israeli bombardment, which lasted for about 51 days. I was just posting on my Facebook uh, some lines or some, you know, uh, posting some images along with some lines and my friends uh, would you know uh, I mean most of my friends at the time and still are from outside of the Arab world not not only from outside of Gaza so uh, many of my friends were English speaking uh, friends so I was posting and I was sh sharing my feelings and my experiences and how I feel and what what my fears were using my language you know uh, and people were reacting positively about what I wrote and that encouraged me uh, to write more and more and use my language and my imagination and my feelings uh, to reflect on what's happening to me because what's happening to me is not happening to me only. It happens to, to, to uh, two million people. Now there are, there are two million and, you know, uh, 200,000 people mostly living in tents in, in, in South Gaza. Uh, so I, I felt like I had this message, I had this ability uh, to write uh, on my behalf and on behalf of many other people who don't have maybe the time or maybe they don't have uh, the energy to write about their feelings and their experiences. Um, so, I mean, I think one thing that helped me um, to, to, to become, to have, to have the confidence that I'm a poet or I'm someone who could become a poet are my friends outside of Gaza. Uh, there, there were some artists, I can't name all of them, but uh, there were some artists and some poets from the US and from Europe uh, who asked me to continue sending them drafts and they would give me some feedback. So I, thought, I, I continued working on my uh, work until I could just write my own writing and send it to magazines and journals. So I'm indebted to my life in Gaza, to the people around me in Gaza, my family and my friends, and my experience. I mean, I survived death at the, at the age of 16. I mean, I still had the scar from a piece of shrapnel that pierced my neck. It was just a few centimeters away from my windpipe. So I, I survived it. Uh, so the war made me a poet. I think if I was born maybe in California or in London, I would just be a, a photographer of, you know, uh, natural scenes. Or maybe I would just be running with my kids here and there without worrying about anything. Uh, I, I know that other people, uh, whether in California or London, they have their own, you know, worries. They, they are poets because they have their own problems or they have some love that they want to share with the world. But I mean, for me, uh, being a refugee, um, being a grand uh, child of a refugee who was expelled from Yaffa, uh, someone, I was born in a refugee camp, and then we moved to live in Bethlehem. I think that helped me. I mean, moving from a refugee camp, which is very densely populated. Uh, and then we moved to Bethlehem, which is a very uh, agricultural uh, town. There are lots of trees and plants. And uh, so it was very different from a refugee camp. So that helped me to know the difference between living in a refugee camp where, where you could hear what you're uh, what your neighbors are cooking or what they are teaching the little children for uh, for school, you know, because the houses are just very close to each other. There are no streets in a refugee camp, you know. Sometimes you share the same wall for two houses. Uh, and then moving to the, to, to Beit Lahia, a different landscape, helped me, I mean, a little bit understand what it means uh, to be living uh, under occupation and under siege. Uh, and then my, my, my experience of traveling to the States and experiencing the different colors of life there, uh, 
you know, the different tongues I, I heard, um, and also the different, the different people. I mean, I was born in 1992, and I left Gaza for the first time in 2017, and I've never, I, I, I won't exaggerate if I said, I only met three or four foreigner, foreigners in Gaza. There are no tourists in Gaza, in Gaza. So I've never had the chance of practicing my English or showing it to people, you know, or just practicing it, just like you practice your English or your Italian or your Spanish, you know, uh, with other people, you know. But I've never had that chance because Gaza is under siege. No people, no, 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 no one is allowed, even relatives are not allowed to, 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 to visit their, uh, their family members in Gaza. And I, uh, I couldn't visit my, my, my aunt who, who was exiled in Jordan uh, in the 1970s. And she couldn't visit us. Uh, she, the only time she visited us was in 2000. And she died last year. So the last time my father, her brother, saw her, and she saw my father, was uh, 23 years ago. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, but one of the things you mentioned remind me of a, a question we got. Um, what advice would you give emerging, emerging Palestinian writers from a creative standpoint, but also from a business standpoint, specifically about getting published? I think, I think publishing poetry in magazines is the first step to being published uh, as, a, as an author. I mean, you can. I mean, you can try. There are nowadays there are uh, some opportunities for people, especially from Gaza and Palestine, uh, to publish their poems in some magazines. There are some certain uh, issues of magazines that are asking people from Gaza or from Palestine in general to submit their work, or, or from Arab writers, because it's now the time uh, for for the Palestinian to tell the world about themselves. I mean, rather than people experts, maybe from America, you know, university professors telling people about Gaza and what's happening. No, no, we can we can tell the whole world about ourselves. We can tell the whole world about our history and about about our poetry. I mean, we can we can write as well as any poet in the world. Okay, so this is the chance of the Palestinian and the Gazan poet in this case um, to write their own poems and uh, to know that. What they are writing is not only poetry, but it's a message that needs to be heard by everyone in the world. And I would uh, suggest reaching out to magazines uh, who are uh, sympathetic with the Palestinians. There are some magazines who are just indifferent about what's happening in Gaza. Uh, here I, told, I, I can mention Poetry Magazine. I published two poems with them. I was kidnapped in 2000, uh, I mean, November last year. They didn't say a word about this. Although many, many other magazines, namely the New Yorker, the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Nation, even CNN wrote about what happened to me and the and Penn International, etc. Everyone, you know, uh, spoke about spoke about what happened to me and they asked for a quick release. But Poetry Magazine didn't didn't, didn't mention a word about this, and that uh, that was disappointing to me. And I even submitted some poems to them and they were rejected um, during the genocide. Uh, I don't know why, but anyway, I think uh, <clears throat> uh, giving a space to the Palestinian, especially now in Gaza, we are now in on in our uh, 193 days of this genocide. Um, I think it's the it's a duty uh, on every magazine in the world, on every TV channel, to not 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 give space, but to to invite the Palestinian poet, to invite them to contribute to invite them to speak, because no one can speak uh, more eloquently and more truthfully about Palestinians, except for the Palestinians themselves, okay? If there, if there are no speakers in Palestine, if there are no poets in Palestine, then okay, maybe some people who know about us can tell the world about us. But we have poets, we have speakers, we have translators, we have award-winning writers, we have Lots of artists in Gaza and in the West Bank and in and, and, and the US and everywhere, okay? But here I'm talking about uh, Palestinians in Gaza who have been uh, dispossessed of so many things, not only electricity and the internet and water, but also of their houses and their 
their their books. Absolutely, very well said. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, back and forth on social media. We had someone ask um, ask a bit about that too. Uh, they wrote your your writing elicits very vivid images. On your social media, we've seen people submitting visual art inspired by your poetry. Um, mm -hmm. What is it like to see how others imagine your words through their art? I think there is a, there is a collaboration between uh, the word and the image. Uh, I think uh, when, I, when I write, so this is something that I don't choose to do, but I think when I write, I write about a scene, about an image, about a video, let's say. It's in my mind. It begins with with something. There are some colors and there are some fruits. There are, there is there is a shrapnel everywhere. There is a, the color of the explosion. So there is there is everything that you want to just uh, uh, imagine in your mind and in your eyes. So I I rely on the image to create my poem. Uh, and as I said, I I pay very careful careful attention to everything around me. I see life in everything. I see life in a book, uh, in in the in the ant that's sleeping on my uncle's prayer rug in winter to to get some warmth. I see everything, okay. And if everything when it happens, it happens at the same time. I can see the ant that I saw fifteen or twenty years ago under the rubble of my of our house. I see it. Every, I see it all at once because this is my life. And my life has been destroyed. Okay, um, so I rely on the image uh, to create my poem. I'm not. I'm saying. I'm not saying this uh, uh, for. I mean, hundred percent about all my poems. But this is how I understand my poem. Because when I start reading my own poems, I can see, uh, you know, that what, what I'm writing could be uh, drawn or could be made into a video. But uh, I like the image so much. And uh, it's easier for the people to see and feel when they s imagine, you know, something like an image rather than abstract ideas uh, or telling them about beauty, just, you know, what, what is beauty, okay? But I can show them an image of beauty. I can show them an image where someone feels uh, in pain rather than saying, you know, the mother is just in pain. I can create an image about this mother in pain that no one can but feel the pain of the mother. Absolutely. Um, this is a broad question, but I'm just going to ask it. Um, how can writing and reading poetry be a political act? I think, uh, I mean, what is politics? I think politics is, is, is about what it means to be part of a community but part of a group okay your relationship with this group so when you say what you think about your role or your uh, you know your value as as a member this is i think politics so when you just try to defend yourself you know you defend yourself as part of a community part of a, a group of human beings this is what i think is politics so when we talk about our rights as palestinians we are not talking about our rights as palestinians no we are talking about our human beings who happen to be Palestinian. And if I was if I was if I was born in in America, I would I would be talking about issues that are happening in America. I can't just keep silent because maybe I'm rich or because I was born maybe on an island that that is detached from everywhere else. I, I was not born on an island. I was not born in heaven. Okay. I was born uh on maybe in, in the street. I was born in the street. On one side, there are huge towers with business with business companies, okay? With uh, rich people, you know, with limousines waiting for them to take them back to their hotels or their homes. And on the other side of the street, there are, you know, tents. There are refugee camps. So I was born there. I was born in the middle. I could see. I saw America. I saw London. I saw everything. Okay. So I can't just keep silent because my father was, let's say, was born 
to a rich family. And I would I would just turn a blind eye to the to the houses and tents opposite our building. No, I was born in the street, and that's where everyone should be staying. Everyone should be seeing what's happening on their left and on their right. You can't just look <laughs> straight into the street because it doesn't it doesn't lead except for blindness. Thank you for that. Um, we have uh, some some people have just asked, they want to ask about you and about your family and how you're doing and what is next, or mm -hmm. if you can even know. Of course, we don't need, things are very in flux in a lot of ways. We don't know what is next. But if you're comfortable sharing, um, specifically has someone ask um, about your brother and your brother's family in Gaza, how are they and and where do you see yourself? Mm. Do you see yourself returning to the United States or or is this something you feel you can even know right now? Well, I think it it breaks my heart that uh, I have a plan right now. I have planned to to go back to the United States and work uh, at one university. Um, and I also have the choice of staying here in Cairo and finding a job. I mean, it, it, it breaks my heart that I can do this as an individual, while at the same time, I know that hundreds of thousands of other Palestinians from Gaza have no, have no path to take. There are no paths in Gaza. There are no houses. Not only there are no houses or there are no universities, but there are no paths, no streets for people to walk on. But I mean, fortunately, uh, I have this opportunity to, I'm still applying for the visa. But I have this chance of coming back to the U.S. with my wife and my kids. But this doesn't mean to anything to me uh, as long as Gaza is bleeding, uh, that my family still lives in tents and they don't have enough food to eat. They don't have healthy water. There, there's, there's no medicine. I mean, there is a big question. Even, even, even though my parents and my siblings are healthy right now, I mean, what, what, what if... I, if one of them or two of them get sick and there are no doctors, no hospitals, no ambulances, there is no medical care there. I mean, we, I can tell you that my parents are eating and drinking and they, are, they have beds to sleep on. But maybe after we finish this call, something else will happen. Um, so, I mean, this, this question uh, is, uh, is a good one, but... Uh, it can the answer can change dramatically. Uh, I mean, on a, on a personal level, uh, I'm working on my visa uh, to be in the United States, hopefully in the summer. Um, yani, as I mentioned, it's, it breaks my heart that I have this choice of going or staying here in Cairo. I was able, by the way, I was able to leave Gaza in December uh, the 3rd because my youngest child was born in America. So that was one reason that allowed me to leave Gaza. I mean, other than other than that, I would be, and I would be happy about that to be with my parents and my siblings and their children. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm uh, I'm very glad to hear that you have, and I'm sure other people are to hear that you have that path. Some people messaging, I think, are specifically anticipating with having you uh, at their institution where they are, um, but certainly. Um, wishing the best for for your family and thank you for for sharing that about them with us thank you um so we're kind of we're coming to the end here um thank you all for being with us and, and a huge thank you masab for being with us today from cairo and telling us about your work and your life and and reading your your poetry to us um um maggie if you could drop in the chat again our uh our fundraiser for the cultural centers in the west bank and also uh, our events page for the one book campaign will be there will be more mm. events. Uh, so before, sorry, before, yeah, before, please. before the people go and leave the chat, I would like to thank everyone uh, who attended this uh, reading and this discussion. Um, I can see Tom, I can see uh, some nice people. I'm not familiar with everyone, but uh, I feel I'm part of this huge family in the world who love uh, freedom, who love justice, who love poetry. Uh, so I, th I I see Dora also, Dora. <laughs> um, 
so I'm very I'm Deborah also. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um. It. It. I think one reason why I continue to write and continue to feel like, uh, there is, you know, there is hope in the world is that I can see people like you, who, uh, who are ready to listen and continue to listen and see the pain and listen to our pain, even though they could just live their own lives, you know, go to restaurants and travel here and there, you know. I mean, no one is asking you to do anything because you are not soldiers who are bombing our houses or killing our uh, loved ones. But you know what it means to be a human being because other people just like you, in this case, me and my family and my parents, uh, could be in your place, and you could be in their place. And I, if I was, I was, if I was in Europe or in America or any any place, I would be doing the same thing, uh, because again, I would say I could be in their place. I could be a refugee. I could be killed. Um, so a huge, a huge thanks to uh, everyone who uh, came today uh, to listen to my poems, and. Uh, this is again exclusive. I will announce uh, something about my uh, next uh, uh, book of poetry, um, inshallah. And I hope it will be something big. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. And, and thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day wherever you are. Take care. Bye bye.